I'm doing it because I'm compelled to make noise, if you will. I'm compelled to say, and it's not an ego thing like my noise is better than your noise, but it's an ego thing in that I think my noise is worth expressing. Um, and I am going to express it till the day I die. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built nerd culture. Today, we're thrilled to welcome a true legend in the gaming industry. He's the mastermind behind the mega popular Twisted Metal and God of War game series and the creator of iconic characters like Kratos and Sweet Tooth. He's also the host of Gabin Plus Games, his popular Twitch and YouTube show where he shares his thoughts on video game news, pop culture, politics, the paranormal, and more. David Scott Jaffe has been responsible for some of our fondest childhood gaming memories and has developed characters, stories, and experiences that have sold millions of copies worldwide. Today on the show, we will be talking with David about his career, what's it really like working in video game development, and his thoughts on gaming and nerd culture today. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Oh, no, it's, it's, I am, I am honored that you were willing to come on. I respect your work. You are, I am not only respect your work as someone that was a, a very, um, successful game developer but i think you're always very honest up front about your feelings on things you give you know you're a straight shooter and i appreciate that sure it's uh it's sad that that's something to be respected not expected but it is what it is yeah that that that's true of journalism generally as well that there there's a little bit there's a little bit too much hemming and hawing uh not enough people just you know like this is actually what i really think this isn't right this isn't that's sort of the political thing. This is how I think things actually are. Right. Okay, so David, uh please tell us a little bit about yourself. How would how would you uh describe yourself, you know, and introduce yourself to our fans and people in the audience and there's probably not too many of them that aren't familiar with what you do. Um well, I don't make video games anymore. I I made video games uh primary well exclusively with Sony, whether it was working for them or working with them where they were our publisher when we were a separate company. Uh, I did that for over 20 years. Like you said, the intro, Twisted Metal, God of War, or some other games that weren't as well received, but still, you know, we got to make them and work with the teams and stuff. Um, so I did that for a while. And then I'm now the last four or five, maybe even more at this point, I'm not sure when I started, I've really gone, you know, more than full time uh, into streaming and videos and uh, kind of opining about all kinds of things. I would say 90% of what I talk about now is is the industry and the business and the uh, game design and game design theory and all that stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, there's, 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 you know, I can't help but deviate from the path a bit and from time to time get into politics. I love talking about, you know, the paranormal, the weird news of the day. And, you know, I, I do that as well on my channel, but I'd say 90% of it is, uh, is, is video game punditry if that's a word mm -hmm. uh that i do these days so that's that's kind of my shtick lately yeah and i i love your show i watch yours you. uh somewhat regularly I'll, i watch it usually also with last stand uh sacred symbols podcasts kind of go both hand in hand i mean when we were when we were starting this up and you were messing with your camera you had uh the materials in the background you had for uh, talking with uh cliff krasinski who's another really big developer so that gives you kind of a sense of I had to show you how on, he, he just wrote a book, Control Freak, which is excellent. Um, and I had him on to talk about we just started a kind of a like a book club, but for video games on my channel. So Gears of War was our first one. And we brought Cliff on to kind of really dive deep into the narrative and the story and the, uh, the play mechanics and, and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, he, he, he was a lot of fun to talk to about that. He's a good dude. Uh, you, you are uh, doing your show, I think, from Alabama. And that's where you grew up, right? No, I did grow up in Alabama. Uh, well, you got it half wrong, half right. Um, so I, I did grow up in Alabama. I, I love the South. If you, you know, extract the racism and ignorance from it, it's a beautiful place. The people are, for the most part, uh, kind and wonderful people other than those things I just mentioned. Uh, but no, I've lived in Southern California for since I was 18 and now I'm 52. Uh, and so now I'm in San Diego, but I've been up and down from 
you know, I was in San Francisco for a time, hated it, but I love SoCal and I've been in LA most of that time and now I'm in San Diego. And you moved down there when you were 18 because, uh, according to Wikipedia at least, uh, you wanted to pursue uh, working in film. That's right. Yeah. I, I went to go to USC because that's where George Lucas went. And I was like, oh, well, that's the path, you know. Um, and so I went out there when I was 18 to go to film school. I never got into film school, but I was always, I was making films since I was like seven years old. So I was making movies and I went out there and I, uh, created some television shows that were sold. They never actually got produced, but I sold a couple of shows to, uh, you know, the big, uh, networks and whatnot. And yeah, I thought that was going to be my career. I was like, oh, I'll do TV. Then I'll go into movies. And I, I went, honestly, I wasn't very talented at it. I wasn't very good at it. Um, but I didn't know that. You know, when you make movies in Alabama, especially back in the 70s and 80s, you're the only fish in the pond. So everyone's like, oh, you must be the next Spielberg. And I'm like, well, I, I, what did I know? But yeah, I wasn't very good at it. And when I was waiting for some of these shows that I had sold to take off, which I was ignorantly uh, assuming would just happen because they optioned them, which means nothing. They option every day. Um you know, I got a job, I needed a job. So I got a job at Sony as a tester. And when I was testing very quickly, you know, it was right on that pivot point where we were moving away or starting to embrace the possibility that games could be cinematic and be more narrative driven and, and have more than just sort of these little jump and pop mascot games like Sonic and Mario, not to belittle those games, but you know, they, they were looked at as sort of, uh, by a lot of people like kind of time wasters and 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 i certainly don't look at them that way but when i got into it i was like oh here's sony here's all their money you know for whatever reason they trust me enough to give me a lot of creative freedom uh so i was like okay well i can get a budget and just start making my that i love let me do that right now instead of movies because why fight my way up the hill to get into the movie business when I already have Sony right here and they're saying, go make what you want. So that kind of began the whole thing. I started as a tester, but very quickly was designing games with, uh, you know, Mickey Mania was our first game that we did for uh, the 16-bit systems and Sega yeah, CD. E excellent, excellent game. Holds up yeah, completely. Uh, that was my, uh, that was the first game I got to work on. I was one of the designers, but it actually was developed in the uk by the the guys who were traveler's tales who went on to do a lot of things like the lego games and whatnot um but and then after that we did twisted metal and there were a lot of failures in between where i had to learn how to work with a team and had to learn what an actual director designer was and it was nothing like i th i mean it was partially what i thought it was but it also was nothing like i thought it was and so uh, there was a lot of turbulence in those first couple of years trying to really sort of figure out where I belonged, how I could fit in. Uh, and we started to get it right working with the guys at uh, uh, Single Track with Twisted Metal and Twisted Metal 2, uh, and then Black and then God of War and, and on and on and stuff. You start, so you start all this as like a young 18 year old, a uh, full of, uh, no? Well, I mean, I went to, I went to college, so I got out oh, of okay, college. So you're like 22, 22 23. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, a little less young, a 22 year old. Uh, and, you know, you have all that confidence, energy, that piss and vinegar. And, you know, in just a few short years, you know, you go from QA, which even today still is often the start of a career track for video right. game design. And I was out of QA in six months. I mean, it was very quick. And then, and then from that, you jumped directly to working as a designer, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we there weren't designers at Sony. There was no job description at that time as designer for the most part, right? So... Uh, my official title in the, the, the org chart was probably assistant producer or something, but my work, no, no one in the world would ever pay me to produce. I'm horrible at it, but th the work was designing and creating and writing and, and doing all the creative stuff, but we weren't there yet. Uh, certainly at Sony, but for the most part as an industry where we had people who's, who were simply just hired to be designers, that was stuff that the artists and the programmers did along with what they did, you know, programming and doing art. And so I was there right as it started to really become a discipline. Um, but yeah, very quickly I was doing that. Uh, I saw the opportunity and I was just like, you know, I, I, I say to people, it's like, you know, you could have put me anywhere in any job probably, and I would have 
somehow found a way to make a mark. Now, I don't know if I would have been as successful. I don't know if I would have been more successful somewhere else, but I was ready to, you know, to, to paraphrase Steve Jobs, I was ready to kind of make my dent in the universe. Uh, and I, I just, I was so driven by that. I had been driven by that since I was a little kid. So I think if you would have put me, you know, uh, as a, as a guy, not that anything's less or better, but, you know, uh, to, you know, 180 degrees away from making video games, maybe, you know, working the checkout window at McDonald's drive through I probably would have certainly, you know, maybe been the CEO by now, um, or at least run their advertising. Cause I, I, I just, any, anything that showed up in front of me that were resources I was going to use to express myself. And so that's kind of, I, that, that's kind of how I kind of square it these days. You know, it's like, Oh, you were there at the right place, the right time. I was like, no, I was there ready to work and I was there ready to sort of just wrestle with the universe until I got my way. And I could have been anywhere and it would have, I would have done something that would may not have been good, but it would have made some noise. So yeah. And opportunity is only one part of the equation. You, yeah. you even when you're in that job, you know, um, I could be wrong. If uh, twisted metal, th that is a game that you pitched yourself, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, and so that you you that was a risk that you were taking yourself to like to try to get Sony to take on this project. By the way, which is like one of the first big 3D games. It was you know the first really kind of the battle derby uh, Coliseum racer setup. Yeah. Uh, and that game is just I mean that is definitely a very David Jaffe game just by uh, by its flavor and kind yeah. of everything that's going I, on. I, I think that's one of the reasons you know a lot of people today say you know, why aren't you making games anymore, this, that, or the other? And I, I, I think, again, it's, it's like I was never really in love with the craft of making games. Um, I, I really didn't enjoy it all that much. I enjoyed having the ideas and working with the teams at certain points along the road and then seeing those ideas in players' hands and seeing them hopefully smiling and laughing and, you know, being engaged, that was just insanely delightful. But... The day to day was drudgery. I did not enjoy it, but I was given so much freedom to, you know, splurge all over the product, if you will, in terms of putting my DNA on it, you know. And I'm not saying that the people who made God of War uh, or Twisted Metal or any of the games I worked on don't also feel that they, I hope they do, were allowed to express themselves through the work. But I, I do agree with you that if you look at Twisted Metal and God of War, you know, at least the earlier God of Wars, the, the template that we laid down, there's a lot of me in that. And I think now it's harder to do that, certainly at a, at a you know, a, a place where you're spending, when you throw in marketing, some games are over a billion dollars, literally, I'm not exaggerating. And that's not even the highest, you know, there's some that are even a little more than that. But um, with, if you put in marketing and production, and so it it's harder now, if not impossible to just sort of be here's the energy of Jaffe or anyone, um, you know, Cliff Blazinski or Corey Barlog or whatever. And we're just going to channel that along with some of the team's energy into this thing that's called a game and it, and we're very reflected in it. And so now the streaming stuff and the video stuff is very similar to me in terms of, it's just an outlet for sort of my desire. That's always been there to go, I want to, you know, have a megaphone and scream at the world and say, I'm here and this is what I'm into and this is what I vibe with. And I don't really, I, I, I would love success in everything I do because it allows me to keep doing it, but I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm doing it because I'm compelled to make noise, if you will. I'm compelled to say, and it's not an ego thing like my noise is better than your noise, but it's an ego thing in that I think my noise is worth expressing um, and I am going to express it till the day I die. And so this is how I do it now because the conduit is so much freer than trying to sort of wrangle with marketing and sales and all the politics of a thousand person team uh, and all of these other things that are AAA video games these days or even to an extent, you know, to a lesser extent, but still meaningful double a video games these days that i'm like half your time if not more is dealing with stuff that's not even about you expressing what you want to express it's just sort of you know paving the road so you can get the game to conclusion so uh 
th- that's that's my long winded answer. Oh no, that's that's a fine answer, and I I certainly agree that dynamics of making games and that that sense of an authorship, it's 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 become so it has become quite a bit diluted just because the teams are so big and even the projects have to be such sure bets now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think most people get it. I mean, a lot of people complain about it, but it's like, look, if you want that kind of product, if you want the bleeding edge graphics, and you want you know some uh you know, a game that's 40 hours and this and that and the other, something's got to give. And I think one of the things that gives in all mediums are uh, the, the the more mainstream stuff, which tends to be the more expensive stuff, not always, but usually, you know, it gets more conservative and, and kind of, it's still good. It's still compelling content, but it's less of a singular or a small group of people's vision. And you tend to have to go to the alt or the indie space for that. We see all that in music. We see it in film. Uh, and I think clearly now we we see it in video games as well, for the most part, not entirely, but it's certainly becoming the norm to say something like that, and it'd be true. Yeah, your career is interesting because you have been on all sides of it. When you enter the video game industry, that was still at a place where you had you know double digit teams that could do a decent sure. sized project. Double digit. I mean, that was a luxury. I mean, I think Mickey Mania was like five people, including us in America. So. Uh, Twisted Metal 1 was probably 13 people, if I remember, but that was a game that cost uh, $850,000 to make what was a AAA game at the time that went on to sell well over a million copies. So, you know, the the, the upside was staggering. Um, That is fascinating, because I think of, like, a game by Ubisoft that's, like, the population of a small country. Yeah. It, I mean, if you just see the list of support studios and their credits, it, I mean, it's, it's people... insane. But so much of that is not because it makes the game better unless you define a better game by production value and graphics and, you know, what I would consider a lot of bloat. I think, you know, as much as I do enjoy, I'm loving, like, for example, I think Tears of the Kingdom is a, a brilliant game, probably the best game of the year. I love Resident Evil 4 remake. I love Dead Space remake. I mean, I'm I'm into the the triple A's, but I think most of the real clever, innovative, fresh, uh, mind blowing sh- is certainly happening still with those smaller teams because it's more singular and they can take more chances. Yeah, definitely. I I wanted to ask you because this is a story I've heard a few places about you, but I kind of like to hear it directly from you. So Twisted Metal. When you guys made that game, uh, for those that haven't played the Twisted Metal series, they're they're very, oh, it's like the name, they almost have a, a metal, like, you know, as in music kind of flavor to them, so a bit more mature edge. You, you, the FMVs, you guys had a problem get, passing them through uh, your team, and it wasn't, it wasn't because, you know, it was about the violence, but apparently because your team was made up of a lot of people who are Christians, they weren't comfortable with the FMVs that had a uh, scanly clad with well, okay, so that is the story I told for a very long time because that was the story I thought was true. Oh. And then I ended up getting uh, the, the the executive in charge of all of Sony at the time was uh, the late Kelly Flock, who was just an amazing guy. Uh, started his career, I think, in the warehouse at EA and ended up running Sony uh, games and ended up running, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he just did so much and was so great, but he came to work at Sony. He saw the movies and even though the Warhawk movies, which were also that same year and that same, mostly that same team that did twisted metal were also just, you know, terrible. I also thought they were pretty boring, but we did focus groups on the twisted metal movies and the focus groups loved them. They thought they were terrible and they were, they thought they were cheesy and they were, but they loved them. And so I thought when the word came down to me, it was explained to me that, oh, well, it's because a lot of the guys that are working on the game in Utah, the single track guys who had broken off from Evans and Sutherland, who were amazing, were and are amazing. Um, I was like, well, they're Mormon, they said so, and they're real religious. And so, and I was really frustrated. And then talking to Kelly many years later, 20 years later, he says, oh, no, uh, I just thought they were horrible. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, you motherfucker. He's like, yeah, and, I, and he says, that's why I let you do movies again on Twisted 2, because I felt bad, because after I got rid of them, people were like, yeah, they're terrible, but they're entertaining. He's like, oh, I just thought everybody wanted to cut them because they were awful. So that story, and that was the story I had been told by my bosses or or whoever was in the know at the time, but and I'm, and I'm sure that factored into it, 
But the main reason talking to Kelly was the Sony executive who was in charge of it was just like, yeah, they're just really bad. And I'm like, all right. I like the other story better, you f***er. But, yeah, you know. it, it's more colorful. But that is, that is kind of funny. It, 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 the, you know, in the 90s, you could almost believe that could be a thing. But that, that would... I. Today, it's like the other direction. So maybe in the 90s in game development, parts of the 2000s, you would have people who are more traditionalists be like, you can't put this out because... Oh, I mean, you know. there, there was that. I mean, I definitely, you know, uh, Calling All Cars was the game I made after God of War, and I made it with that same team. And in that case, I started that game as an X-rated, cell-shaded cartoon inspired by the independent comic artist R. Crumb. And he did a lot of uh, comics that were, you know, very body and sexual and drugs and dope and, you know, uh, moonshine and drinking and all. You know, it's very much like, you know, comics, but for adults, like comics with an X, basically, C-O-M-I-X. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the team were just like, we're not comfortable with this. And I'm like, what are you not comfortable with? And I remember one, it was like a little top-down cartoony game, and there was like a neon sign with a naked lady, and she had tape over her boobs, because God forbid you'd see nipples. And um, it was like, oh, that's a bridge too far. I'm like, okay. So we ended up keeping the art style, but we ended up removing all the kind of X-rated stuff, and the game ended up tanking. And I really should have, you know, figured out how to solve that. I didn't, at the time, I didn't think about it. I didn't know to think about it. Now, I would look back and say, well, either you need to fight for the X-rated stuff or you need to totally change the cartoony stuff because you're basically, in essence, a PS3 launch window game. Like, you were in the first year of the PS3 on PSN, and nobody who's just bought a $500, $600 brand new system is going to want to play a little game that looks like it's made by Nintendo. You know, people who bought PlayStation 3s at launch were not that kind of gamer. They wanted cutting edge, cool fuck shit. I just didn't think about it at the time. Looking back now, we should have just rebranded it and called it, made it a twisted metal game. Um, and we probably would have sold buckets, but got great reviews, so I'm happy. I still love the game. Yeah, I, in the flavor department, I, I, I think some people feel with these new God of Wars that they're a bit they're a bit diluted from what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they definitely are. That's not bad. It's I mean, it's it's but they're definitely not my God of Wars. No way. No way. Yeah, no. And I, I have actually played Calling All Cars back in the day. Mm -hmm. I have friends. I did not purchase it because I didn't own a PS3. Mm -hmm. I, just did, right. I just did not have spare 600 bucks at the time. Yeah, it was very expensive. But uh, I remember it being very good, but I remember it being kind of disappointed because you had been expecting something more like what Twisted Metal. But it, but it, and But the gameplay was strong. It was really yeah, interesting I, gameplay. I love it. It was great. Great, really fun party game, really fun uh, local uh, co-op or low-op competitive so you know they don't all hit but they were all fun to work on that's one of my favorites we've done i i think the biggest lack of that game that other than just sort of getting the um the the the, the candy wrapper of the mechanics wrong because like i said was probably we just didn't put enough defense in it and so it it was very shallow it was fun but shallow and if we would have just added one or two mechanics that would have allowed you to counter the enemies trying to take the prisoner from your car, I think we would have had it probably an evergreen game that people would still be playing or wanting to play more of today. But for me, it was like bubble gum. It was awesome. But after two rounds, I had to put it away. I was done. And then I would come back to it a few weeks later, but it would never sustain me like, oh, I got to play again. I got to play again. I got to play again because there just wasn't enough depth to it. I don't mind, though, necessarily a game that that doesn't doesn't demand that much of my time. I mean, a lot of games are fine that way, but yeah. The, I mean, the, be the best games do both, right? I mean, the best games, you know, allow you to kind of get in and get out if, if they're kind of gamey games, not narrative-based games. But if you really want to invest time, um, there's a lot of places to go. And I think that's sort of the sign of a great game. Uh, I was a better game director than game designer. There are people that are really into the systems of games, and I, I find those things fascinating. But I just, like I said, it, it's such a rookie mistake to not have put defense in Calling All Cars. But, and now I know that, but it wasn't intuitive, right? It's not like I went to school for this. So most of the stuff I did was uh, based on sort of just gut and intuitive and playing other games and assessing them and figuring out what works and what doesn't. And uh, there are people out there that are much more wired to understand and take great joy in creating game systems and uh, uh, how those systems inter interact with everyone. So like I said, I'm playing Tears of the Kingdom right now. 
Uh, it's delightful. It's wonderful. It's all all the stuff people are saying about it that is great is is absolutely true. Um, I could have never designed that game because what's brilliant about it is the ability, w w the developers, the designers, whoever made these choices on this game specifically about letting you solve puzzles pretty much in however the f*** you want to do it. And it doesn't mean anything you do works, but it does mean that the rules of the universe are there and you can, within those rule sets, you can pretty much do whatever you want. And so what should work does work. And so instead of ever getting stuck on a puzzle, like for me, the fun was I'm going to design a puzzle and then you're going to solve it eventually the way I want you to solve it. And then you'll feel good. And I'll also have my ego stroke because it's like, that was a really good puzzle, you know, and it, it's very written. It's a very scripted experience. Um, and I'm okay with, I'm good at that. I think I'm good at that and integrating that into a narrative and commercial narrative and all that. But the idea of going, okay, design 10 chess pieces in essence and make sure they all kind of sort of work together and they have a c connection with the environment and a connection with the combat system and then let the player have the freedom. I, I would never have thought of that. My brain would have just never taken me on that journey to get to that conclusion. So th that's real game design. Um, and I was never great at it and I never frankly enjoyed it. My brain, my brain is not, you gotta be more analytical. I think you gotta be a little bit more mathematical. Uh, you don't have to, but the people who are really good at that kind of thinking tend to be better at those uh, other subjects as well. Um, that was never my thing. And I don't necessarily think that, yeah, you know, some of your, uh, less popular games are failures necessarily. I think the part everything's of the a failure. Everything's a success. I mean, it's you know there there are there are metrics you can use to say it didn't make you know drawn to death didn't make its money back. In that sense, it was a failure. But I'm very proud of it. I think there's some great innovation in that game. There's some great thematic in that game. Um, some great gameplay in that game. But you know, and what I was trying, what I was trying to get is like so much of game development is iterative, and but often you don't get that second chance for whatever reason. Finances don't work out. Your investors pull out. Just some weird crap happens. And so you don't actually get to do the follow-up game. Well, or that's the iterative updates. at the end of the game. But the best development is when you can iterate at the right time during, before the first one even comes out. Because, you know, I remember being at GDC right after Twisted Metal and there was this guy who gave a talk at the Game Developers Conference about game design documents and you know game design documents to this day they're not even really much of a thing anymore but certainly back then there was no standard you know it wasn't like a script where it's like here's the format and here's what everybody uses it was like it's however you can communicate it and he was going on and on about you know you should be able to hand your design document to the team and you ideally not ideally but you tragically could die in a you know a snowboarding accident but because you had designed the game on paper that would be the game that they created. Like they were almost like uh, you were the architect and they were just constructed construction workers. And we were all, cause I had had, you know, a couple games in my belt. We were all like, what the f are you talking about? That's not, you can't design, you know, maybe now with AI and chat GPT. And if you're working with a template game and it's like, well, we've already made this game five times. We know what it is. Okay, you you get a little you get better and better at kind of, you know, hitting your target. But most games you're absolutely right. It's iterative during production. It's like, you know, God of War 1 started out uh, you know, I remember we were I I had the programmers putting in attacks that Kratos had that never worked because the camera was fixed and I was pulling weapon designs from Twisted Metal 2, which was a third person over the shoulder camera. And it never even occurred to me that that mechanic that I was ripping off from, let's say, the hearse in Twisted Metal 2 could not be given to Kratos because the camera was not the same. And it was just some stuff, you know, it, it, the more you can think about it, the more you realize you should or shouldn't do it. But even when you've thought about it and you think you've crossed every T and dotted every I, once the programmer puts it in, you're like, oh, f I thought about this, that, and the other, but I never thought about how this, that, and the other would interface with this character that we've designed. And now when those two come together, it's just a cluster, right? It's it's totally about innovation or, sorry, yeah, iteration. Absolutely. You have to. 
God of War, especially that first entry, um, any of the, the original trilogy is great. Or you worked on some of the other entries, though, too, I think, right? Mostly God of War 1. I. I did writing on God of War 2. I was the creative director, and for about five to six months, that was really important because Corey had never directed a game, which wasn't so much about Corey not being capable of directing a game right out the shoot. I think, honestly, the only real steering I gave other than being one of the co-writers to the, the God of War 2, was kind of helping Corey understand that his job was to push back on anyone and everyone that was getting in the way of the vision, and that included the head of the company, right? So I remember the first version of God of War 2 that Corey kind of showed me, and they started making it, and I was just like, this is linear, it's too linear, it's boring, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, yeah, but I'm being told that you know, we just want to kind of put this out as a as a quick sequel because the first game did so well. Um, and so all the stuff I want to do, I'm being told that's too much to make the date. And I said, then I, I don't remember if I use these words, but it just was, well, are you happy with it? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, I'm not happy with it either. Why don't you push back? And he's like, I didn't know I could do that. Right. And so he's just like, no, this isn't good enough. And once he started realizing, you know, it's a dance with the executives or marketing or or the money people or whatever, and your job is to push back. Your job is not to be, to get a pat on the head by him and go, boy, you're a good worker because you'll be one of the first people laid off when the game comes out and fails. And they're like, oh, well, get rid of that team. Let's bring, you know, y you need to be hated until you're loved. And sometimes you're hated because you push back. And nobody wants friction. Nobody wants to have to go home at work in the end of the day with a headache because the des designer, the director, you know, wouldn't just acquiesce. But end of the day, um, that's what it takes. And so once Corey had that mentality and understood that that was not only acceptable but desirable, uh, he was off to the races. And other than just sort of, you know, asking, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Uh, he, he didn't need any, uh, he didn't really need much help. Kratos is such an interesting character. That I don't know who that is. Who's Kratos? Kratos. Kratos. Oh, there you go. There you Kratos. go. I've heard of that guy before. Uh, it's. I think. It's, I think it's one of those things where, like, you know, when you read a, a book. or No, an it's article. not. You're just saying it wrong. Okay, let's okay. keep going. What about him? Yeah. Okay. All well, right. Well, however, however you're supposed. However to you say, say his name, which is Kratos, used to be Dominus, by the way, ended up becoming Kratos. But what about him? He's a fascinating looking character. Uh, you guys were doing uh, uh, a game based on uh, Greek and Roman mythology, and this is even before 300, which kind of like made it mega popular. And then even the look of Kratos is really interesting because he has he has like these red stripes, and he's kind of an older looking character. What was your what was your inspiration there? Like, how did you end up going with that design? Well, so at the very beginning. I mean, I knew it was going to be Clash of the Titans meets, you know, I think the pitch was, you know, what if Paul Verhoeven directed Clash of the Titans? And if you don't know Paul Verhoeven, I did another design document, which was the exact same document, but the pitch was what if Ridley Scott directed Clash of the Titans? Because people knew Ridley Scott. But Paul Verhoeven had done, you know, and continues to do to some extent, you know, he did like Robocop, Total Recall, a bunch of like over the top gore, but still wonderful. It like, it looked, it, it took joy in its, um, overt sexuality and it's overt violence and so that was the idea right and so in that referencing clash of the titans at first we were just kind of going with a traditional hollywood sword and sandals guy with like a toga and i had you know one of the plume hats which is kind of roman but whatever but hollywood's like yeah it's all the same um and so we were building it off that so a lot of people today are like well what about you know the skin color of somebody who was born in sparta and not you know this island and i'm like dude Literally, the only research I did on Greek culture was Clash of the Titans and Ray Harryhausen. And then I read um, Edith Hamilton's kind of brilliant mythology book, which covered all the mythology. And I had always loved Greek mythology, but it wasn't like I was sitting there doing DNA tests on people from the old country and going like, ah, you, I mean, no, um, which is not to say that that's a bad idea. But people come at me today asking and I'm just like, dude, that was I, I wasn't even thinking that. But anyway, so he kind of looked you know, costume wise, like Harry Hamlin in the 81 classic classic is great. Terrible movie, but it's great. If you were a kid, uh, clash the Titans. And very quickly we're like, well, look, nobody's going to want to play this because nobody wants to play this guy. He's wearing like, a little dress and he's got his sandals and you know, you want somebody who's a badass. And he was 
from the very beginning, I wanted him inspired by Wolverine, the Hulk. Um, you know, I wanted him to be sort of just this id of of rage and anger and tenacity. And, and I'm like, this guy ain't cutting it. So we spent a shit ton of Sony's money and time, which I guess is the same thing, um, trying to figure out who this guy was visually. And ultimately, you know, we had Terry Crews, who remains just a brilliant art director, and Charlie Wynn. Uh, who I who went on to design Thor and a bunch of the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, characters. Uh, so he he left Sony a while back and became their, you know, visual guru for a while. Um, but those two guys eventually, uh, I had come back from the movies seeing uh, American History X, which is about uh, sort of the neo Nazi movement in America, and I guess the late '90s or whatever. And Ed Norton got all buff and. Uh, it is the first time I ever even heard of the concept, let alone seen the concept of a curb stomp where he like took this guy and he told him to put his mouth on the concrete, uh, edge of the road. And then he just st stomped him between his neck, uh, and his, you know, the whole thing just went like a melon. I was, oh my God, you know, and people come at me now and they're like, you base Kratos on a Nazi. I'm like, no, I didn't base his character on a Nazi. It was the aggressivity and the physique and the just insane sense of you looked at that character that Ed Norton played and you said he's either going to have to be stopped by putting him down with fucking you know a uh, massive caliber weapon uh or he won't stop and that was what was appealing to me about Kratos and what I realized in that scene where he does the curb stomp he's just kind of wearing shorts and you, he's just exposing the physique that I guess as an actor because he's Ed Norton he's a little skinny guy clearly had spent a lot of time perfecting for that role and so I took that to Charlie and I took that to Terry and I was just like this the more armor we put on this guy the less animalistic he looks the more we kind of strip him down and give him only the basics he starts to look like a an animal and that's kind of what we want. And so once we kind of had that North star, uh, everything else kind of in terms of his visual design very quickly, uh, fell into place. It's an extremely, uh, captivating, engaging, yep. really compelling visual. Cause you see, you just see that character. You don't even need to know too much about the game. We're like, Whoa, you know, what, what's going on here? The, the intensity you can just see. In, yeah. in this and it just and we chose a character i remember at the time we chose a face that was not traditionally good looking we wanted his nose to have been broken we wanted him to have scars we didn't want him to look like okay tom cruise is playing a grizzled guy but underneath it it's still this obviously really attractive human we wanted him to be you know at, at best average and then you could see the kind of miles on his face and um I loved that about him. I love that he wasn't this traditional video game leading man character. And it just, it just didn't seem right. And so uh, I think that certainly contributed. And then of course the white skin uh, was a total luck thing because it, it totally came out of a misunderstanding that I had about how artists use primer. Um, and I ended up seeing it before it was finished being painted and I loved it. And so that led to us writing the part in the story that he was wearing the ashes of his dead wife and kid. And that's one of my favorite stories about video games because, you know, it's it's so not just iterative in the mechanics, but, you know, art gives way to programming solves and programming gives way to design needs. And the only reason we even have the Blades of Chaos to begin with is that we need, you know, when we had our cinematic camera, the camera was pulled back far enough because we needed to see the combat, but you were losing Kratos in the, in the, in the scrum, you know, he was getting visually lost. And so we looked at this game Sega did on PS2, which was Shinobi, which was a ninja game. But what he had was, it wasn't a remake of the old arcade game. It was a new over the shoulder Shinobi ninja game, but he had this really long flowing red scarf. And we were like, you know what? No matter what's happening on the screen, we always can see our guy because we see that scarf. And then one of our designers, Joe Wright, she said, well, why don't we do that? You know, maybe we give him these chains. And so suddenly we're like, oh, and then that gave way to writing the story about the chain blades, which gave way to going, oh, Ares gave them to him, which gave way to, you know, writing him as the antagonist. So it's it was such a neat... Um, 
and you don't always get that chance, but with Sony, because, you know, the games took a long time to make, but not like they take today, that we had that, we, we, we got to swim in those pre-production waters where this influenced that and that influenced this, and then in turn that went back and influenced something else. And that was such a great way to ex the creative, you know, to, to take the creative journey that I think we really benefited from that, to kind of hit the ground running. Um, and just to make the assets for a game today uh, is is going to take you three or four years. The idea of let's put three years in front of that or two years in front of that or X percent in front of that just to pre-production, that's uh, mostly unheard of, unless you're Nintendo probably these days. Yeah, and it's harder when you have a team, you know, of hundreds or thousands of people to get that it kind is. of magical happenstance that you might see with like a, a, a smaller crew or people who are able yeah, to see. Yeah, that's a great point. Imagine that. Imagine the number of, oh, hey, that could be his wife's and kid's dead dead body ashes. You probably have on a team of a thousand. There are probably 50 or 60 of those moments that were lost just because the team is so big that that magic could have happened. But you just, you, the right people didn't pass each other in the hallway. Because in a lot of cases, there's not even a hallway. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so much of uh, game development these days, you know, so much of it isn't even in person. And I'm not against uh, remote work per Nor se. Nor am I. I think the benefits outweigh the cons, but sure. Yeah, I could see that why they might have an impact. So I love those games. I, I don't know if you could probably tell. I'm sure you hear that a lot. Uh, I do. The older I get, the more I hear it uh, because people have grown up and they can express it and they can find me to express it. And the older I get, the more it means to me um, because I think the older I have gotten, uh, you know, I lived a pretty and I still do, but I lived a pretty privileged life. You know, I, I had crazy but loving parents. Um, um, I went to a really good school. I'm straight. I'm white. I'm cis, you know, I have all these advantages that a lot of people don't even think about if you have them. But as you get older and as you have kids and as you, you know, diversify your friend groups and stuff, you realize that not everybody had the same, you know, kind of smooth sailing that you did. And so with that awareness mixed with the fact that you have lots of people from all walks of life that will come to you now and say the games that you guys worked on, that you and the team worked on, really meant something to me, or they helped me, or they gave me escape, or they gave me comfort, or they gave me inspiration. Well, that was never the intention at all. That was nothing we were thinking about. Um, the older you get and the more you realize that for a lot of folks, including you, not you, but like mm -hmm. the royal you, um, not that I'm the royal you, but you know, just in general, that we all eventually <laughs> are gonna have to deal with our bag of hammers. Um, you know, there's a the, it's like the movie Sullivan's Travels. I don't know if you ever saw that. It's a real old movie, but it's about a film director who uh, uh, he makes these comedies that the world loves. And he goes to the studio executives and he's just like, I want to make my serious movie now. I want to make this real angsty thing. And, uh, and they're like, don't do that. And he's like, no, I have to say something about the world. And he travels across the country to kind of find the real dark underbelly of humanity and it just goes awful for him. And in the end, he ends up being arrested and he's in prison. And one night they show one of his movies to all the criminals uh, that are behind bars. And he looks around, and everybody's just laughing and laughing and laughing. And he realizes that, you know, he has contributed. You know, he had, and I'm not, I'm not saying our work has been as impactful as Sullivan's Travels or what that movie was they were watching in the narrative, but the older you get, the more you start to realize and be grateful for the fact that, hey, you got to be part of something that brought people that you don't even know uh, some release, some joy, some escape. So I, I love hearing it the older I get. Well, uh, no, and I, I agree. The value of, of finding that the work you do has a has a positive impact or it leaves some kind of legacy is a special feeling. I think it's yeah. a big part of what sets being a creative apart from other professions. Mm. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, 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 the, the, the reason I say, I don't know is, I mean, the other thing is kind of, you also start to recognize there is a real, um, uh, karma is the wrong word and the butterfly effect is probably the wrong word as well, but you start to recognize the impact everything has. And I don't mean it like a metaphorical way, like we're all connected. I don't mean that like, 
I'm not like talking, you know, platitudes. I, I'm saying that you you start to have experiences if you were, were like if you smile at someone at the grocery store. Um, that alone is 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 you know firing chemicals in that person's brain where it's like that made me feel better that they smiled at me which then makes them be a little bit happier so that when they pick up their kid from school they can give that kid a little bit more of their time and attention which in turn because the kid got a pat on the head by showing his mom or dad the artwork motivates the kid to stick with art and they become something that gives joy to the whole world or whatever. I'm not saying I have an experience where I've done that. I wouldn't know. But you experience enough that you go, you know what? Everything that we're doing, whether you are a creative or you're a doctor or you are a food service worker or whatever, uh, for good or for bad, is really showing us how connected the whole organism is of humanity and just life in general. And I, again, I, I know that sounds uh, kind of like I'm trying to... I'm I'm not saying it like a woo woo Oprah moment, like we're all connected. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, if you could see, like if you were AI and you were a super, super duper computer and you could stand back and see this choice and what that choice affected, you could actually track it and go, wow, these choices caused this, these choices caused, caused that. And even though I can't track it, I can track it enough to know that it's actually the underpinnings of how a lot of this is working. And I think it makes it makes you recognize that everybody is playing a role for this organism that we are. Even even if you don't like get big public acknowledgement, that is true. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, hundred um, percent. And, and even you know, one of the things I love about doing my stream is you know I I have a very heavy engagement with the chat and I do a lot of comments. I'm very accessible, but I know there are people um, who watch and they lurk. And I know there are people, you know, I'm not saying I know like, oh, I tend to, you know, bring a lot of depressed people to my show. But on any given day, there's probably somebody watching who's having a hard time, whether it's chronic, like it's a chemical issue with with depression or whether it's they've just had something really bad happen or they're just lonely. And I love that in in a very small way, because it's not like I'm some massive streamer, but in a very small way, I can be there with those people and we can have a connection and it's like okay i can't solve your problems but i can i can be there you know i can connect and and that means a great deal to me actually so david tell me what do you think of the new god of war titles the new god of war i loved uh the 2018 god of war thought it was fantastic um really thought it was great the latest god of war ragnarok i think is wonderfully executed i think the sound uh everything from the sound design to the music to the voice acting uh the graphics are really good the controls are really good it's it's a wonderfully executed title i think um and maybe my first four hours i was really in love with it i was like this is like a big uh badass cinematic sequel summer movie thing i was really vibing with it and then Somewhere around hour four, five, or six, it just the pacing just slugged. You just it just slowed to a sluggish crawl, and I couldn't I couldn't play more than eight or nine hours. It was just too, uh, just it was, lumbering's the wrong word, but it feels right. It just felt so, just poorly paced and disrespectful to my time. Uh, it was just like. It, it just didn't make any sense why it had been paced that way. Um, and I just got too frustrated and I haven't had any desire to go back. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it does, it definitely feels like the the new, two newer God of War games. We just like, I, it wasn't even like six, no, it was six months ago that the newest one came out. I, yeah. They're they're basically movie games. They're kind of like the cinematic movie game that, like, that Sony is really into right now. So like, sure, Last of Us, Nathan Drake. So I get that because I've heard that from other people like, you know, I really like the old God of War and you know, I, I, I want to like this new one, but it just doesn't do it for well, me. Well, again, I liked the 2018 one. I thought it was great. I don't I don't have a problem that they changed it. I just think that if you're going to if you're let's put it this way, if you're going to go cinematic, one of the uh, skills that people who make movies have is editing and pacing and uh, uh, iterating on the runtime to make sure that you're getting the emotional and, and satisfying content 
without boring the audience. And so I think with this God of War, it just it it really dropped the ball on pacing. Part of that is, even though I know it's not an open world game per se, there's enough of an open world aspect and a freedom aspect to it that, you know, it, it, it's to me personally, and everyone's going to, it's just, a, there's no right answer to this, but to me, when you have an open world game, part of the skill that is very invisible, uh, and I've never made one, but I play a lot of them, uh, is that you offer too much freedom at your own kind of peril. And the minute you give the player the reins of uh, pacing, you're kind of at the mercy of whatever weird shit the player is obsessed with. So if I'm really into collecting and I'm a completionist, as much as I want to continue the story, uh, let me just go explore over behind that thing because you never know. There could be something there. And that's going to trump... Um, you know, the, 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 the value of pacing at that particular moment and some games do it better than others. But I think God of War really God of War Ragnarok really kind of struggled with that, where it gave the gamer a lot. And a lot of the, the side quests were great and the level design and the side quest puzzles were great, but it, 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 it gave me so much freedom that for a game like that, I felt overwhelmed and then that ultimately led to boredom where something like Tears of the Kingdom I'm playing and I'm able to play it in any order I want um, and I'm not sure why that game, I was going to say, I'm not sure why that game doesn't feel at least so far poorly paced, but I think a lot of it is, is because I like Elden Ring, which I also loved. I can, there's a lot of things I can do that are compelling and fun if I go off the beaten path or if I get stuck on the main path, there are things I can do to make my job following the main path easier. Whereas I found with, I'm sure some of that's there in God of War, but I just, it, I didn't find they danced very well together. The freedom and the narrative, it, it felt like there was a mismatch there. Yeah. And I think as I've seen with some other big open world games, they struggle to find a balance. Uh, Hogwarts legacy, which I enjoyed overall, but it's like once you leave the 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 school, the castle, narrative is much it's much less feels like it's the game control. It's more at your leisure. But you you had that point about editing where there's a rhythm, there's a there's a beat to the design, and it's hard to get that when when it's so open ended. Yeah, so that was my problem with that one. But I thought 2018 was great. Loved it. it the other controversy with you with that game, I uh, I remember. I think it's inverse magazine they they put out something how they thought that this is so wonderful this new game it, it it's it's not awful like those old misogynist god of war oh, games you don't mean ragnarok you mean 2018s yeah i mean yeah or either I mean, really but yeah and then you were chiming is like no this is not misogynist you know it never no, was that i mean that. They're, they're idiots they don't know what misogyny means are the old games overtly sexual yes um, are the old games, um, you know, potentially juvenile and vulgar? Uh, I don't have a problem with those things, but I could see how some people might say they are. Uh, but they're certainly not misogynistic. And I, I, I would be willing to hear an argument that maybe they're sexist to men and women, but I don't know. I would be surprised if they could win that argument, but my mind is open. I don't have to be right about it. And I've done things in the past where I'm like, that's not sexist. And it's like, oh, it is. I'm like, oh, shit, you're right. You know, I, I, I don't have a dog in the fight other than I just want to, you know, uh, be smart enough to feel confident in my position. But as to misogyny, though, uh, at least got a war one and two, which I was involved with. I had nothing to do with three. So a lot of people... We'll talk about, oh, well, what about this from God of War 3? I'm like, I didn't work on God of War 3. I can't speak to God of War 3 or God of War Ascension. But God of War 1 and 2, uh, yeah, I don't see anything misogynistic about those games. And no one has ever been able to, like, well, what about the sex? I'm like, sex is misogynistic. It's like, well, you're having sex with these two women. A threesome is misogynistic. W what's misogynistic about it? They're they're not being raped. They're not being demeaned. They literally tell Kratos to come back to bed. They're having a good time, too. They're moaning and shit. And it's like... It may make you uncomfortable. It may seem a little cringy because, you know, how we portrayed sex was a mini game, like from track and field from Konami in the 80s. I get it. 
Um, but that said, though, you know, what's misogynistic about it, right? It's fascinating to me being a gamer all my life. I remember a time where the problems with a sex with with the um, sexual content in games was more on the other perspective. It was people who are saying, you know, like they're really against the hot coffee uh, situation with the Grand Theft Auto. They're, you know, maybe they're like, even though that wasn't real, but those supposed uh, fellow Christian programmers all the way back when you were working on uh, the first uh, Twisted Metal. I feel like we've we've gone from that place where it's almost like a puritanism we don't like this stay away but now we've just completely flipped the other direction but the, the in essence the result is the same yeah I, I i think a lot of people have i mean i don't mean to be a dick we're we're all we're all in my opinion um blind to our uh, no shit, jeffy we're blind to our blind spots right so it's not like i have some kind of monopoly on maturity and self-awareness that other people lack i think when it comes to a lot of though of the culture issues i think it's important for me or i'm grateful that i you know and it's a place of privilege i've said this before it's not like this is my makeup like i'm some kind of great person because of it i mean i you know i have the money I don't need to work right now. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of privilege in my life. And in that, I don't have to care what you think. You know, it, it, nothing like, I don't mean you personally, but I mean, I, I it you know, unless I, you're a family member or a good friend, what do I care? Right. But, I, but it, you know, and in that, I'm able to sort of, my vantage point of the culture wars is, you know, it's not crazy unique, but it's definitely not the majority uh, where I think a lot of people really feel that the culture wars, whichever quote side you sit on uh, or fight on, um, affects their day to day. And I'm just like, I don't give a f what you think. Um, I don't care if you have an issue with uh, Disney putting, uh, you know, a gay character in Strange Planet or whatever that movie is that a lot of people got upset about, or there's a, uh, uh, a kissing scene with uh, two men in what is it? The Buzz Lightyear movie or two women? I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Then don't watch it. But I'm not gonna. It's you know, you're a fucking idiot in my opinion. But you know, a lot of people really, it means more to them. It only means something to me when they take that ignorance or they take that hate and they express it in a way that hurts other people. Uh, that that's when I kind of go, okay, now you've kind of gone a little bit too far there, but. Short of that, I think things like people, like you said, we've gone around the bend or we've gone, you know, 180 degrees or um, it still kind of all comes from the same place, probably, which is, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's 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 a bigger topic and I'm not super educated on it enough to really say more than the surface, which is if you stripped out the financial value that the powers that be and the very wealthy, uh, which are the powers that be, gain from keeping the culture wars going, you might have one or two topics that really become difficult to find a common ground on. But if you if you removed the financial value of keeping the middle class and the slightly upper and slightly lower middle class at each other's throats, um, I, I I think ultimately most people just want to be happy and live their fucking lives. They don't really care. But you know, everything from it's engaging to it's entertaining um, to they feel shitty about their lives because their job, which the man wants to keep them in, you know, is uh, creating a need for entertainment and escape and a sense of let me feel better about myself. I'll look at that other marginalized person and make fun of them. And now I feel better, you know. But you shouldn't have to feel better. You shouldn't feel to begin with. But you feel because, you know, you, you're working a job you don't love. Uh, you're terrified of losing your job and being homeless. So you got to continue to make money for the man and they keep you and taking all your power away. I mean, it, like I said, it's a big topic. And I think if you're going to talk about the culture wars, I think it's important to, you know, to talk about the real reason the culture wars exist. Um, and it's not because suddenly a large percentage of the Republican Party is like, I'm really worried about trans athletes in sports. No, you're not. 
When's the last fucking time you went to a, a, a girl's softball game or a, a, a girl's volleyball game? Never. Now you suddenly care, right? It's because you've been conditioned to care because people will get money and power if you care. Um, and, and, you know, in the process, you make a lot of people's lives miserable who are already marginalized and beaten up and pushed to the edge. But it goes both ways. And uh, like I said, it's hard to talk culture wars realistically if you don't really talk about the elephant in the room, which is the people who are uh, designing the culture wars and benefiting from them. I agree. I agree on, on these two stances. I'm, I'm, you know, I am more culturally right leaning probably than you are, but I agree in being a nonpartisan because it's like, I am not offended if the, the new Little Mermaid movie comes out and you like it more or you think, you know, having Black Ariel is great. That does not bother me in Iota. I don't lose an ounce of sleep. I, I don't care. I mean, yeah, who cares? Yeah. It's a movie. You don't, you don't like it, I'll go see it. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of how being a nerd in the pop culture in general used to be. It was like, we can disagree on whatever it is and that's fine. And if, if now it's like everyone is so at each other's throats but you do make the good point that feels like does anyone really feel like they gained any ground do we and do we think like there are important things that we maybe should have been paying more attention to of than course the... I, I think and look i am guilty of it too you know uh if if on your deathbed kind of like you know when you look at your phone at the end of the week or the end of the day and it's like here's how much time you spent on twitter here's how much time you spent doing this here's how many miles you walked you know if you were to look at the number of things that you personally felt at the end of the day were kind of useless conversations, you would you would probably, including me, would probably weep at the time wasted. Um, but at the same time, though, I think it's important to recognize that that need, like, why do we have that need? Right. It's 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 it really drives me crazy when a lot of people push back on like, oh, you should go outside. You should get off the computer, or, you, you know. As if there's some nobility to that, and maybe there is in terms of, you know, the, the the air you breathe that's circulated better than the air in your house or whatever. But fundamentally, what they're basically saying is they're judging you because you are choosing to uh, spend your time in the digital world and without taking into account for better or worse, and sometimes it's for worse, the digital world offers what we have lost and continue to lose with our current types of government in the world and unregulated, unregulated, I don't mind capitalism, I mind unregulated capitalism. Um, people are like, look, yeah, I probably did waste too much time arguing on Twitter, but it was the one point in my whole f***ing day that I felt like I had some power that it felt like I was actually able to stand up without the fear of losing my job or the fear of losing my family or the fear of losing whatever it is that is motivating people and just go, you know, make some fucking noise and, and feel like they mattered. And I, I think, again, you can't talk about these things if all you talk about is the surface. I, I love the culture wars from a standpoint of discussing and debating and all that, but I, I think you have to really dig under deeper than that because there's there's people using them because they're sad because they have to escape because they don't feel agency in their own fucking lives and so i don't i don't i don't shame those people i go yeah i get it life's really fucking hard sometimes and who, who wouldn't you know get in the escape pod and and lose themselves in elden ring or twitter wars or whatever it is that your particular internet addiction is or digital addiction is i agree and it's one of the things i appreciate about you is that you you know you are open and honest and you know like i've seen you on a whole bunch of different things i already mentioned colin moriarty's podcast mm -hmm. and this and i like that you know i and I, that's how really i feel about things it's like you can disagree as much as you want that's fine as long as we aren't like attacking each other as terrible people you know but this is just our opinions that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't think on. most people are terrible. I really don't. I don't even think the people who are terrible are terrible. I think there is something. Somebody, I think it was Cliff Blazinski this weekend when I was talking to him on my show, um, you know, was talking about something happens when you become a billionaire. Not that Cliff's a billionaire, but he knows billionaires, you know. And, he, and, 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 you know, the outside view is you just become an asshole. Or when you get power, like po politicians, the fact that, like, in California, we have, like, a 
92 year old Diane Feinstein senator who literally can't sit up and refuses to give up her fucking seat um, in the Senate. It's, it's bad for everybody but her own ego, right? There's got to be something about getting that level of power and or that level of money that I think we would all be susceptible to. I don't think maybe the human brain is is yet evolved enough to handle that. So I even have compassion for those folks. But certainly outside of that, I think even the worst people, you know, are coming at things if they're really angry. Um, you know, they're coming at it from a emotional place because they're sad and they're upset and they they won't they they may not be able to meet you at a place where they can sort of have a self-reflection of why they're saying what they're saying. And it doesn't mean that I will let people push me around. I'll I'll stand up for myself and my friends and family, but I do understand that a lot of that hate is coming from fear and coming from sadness. Um, because like, well, I, I, you know, I have a trans son, right? There are people who've never met my son. There are, ne there are people who have never met me and understood how we arrived at the decision uh, to, to raise our son as we are raising our son, whatever that mm -hmm. means, but they will hate me and they will hate my son and they will uh, act as if I'm a terrible parent and they will die on that hill. And I'm like, I know fundamentally, if we were to sit down and have an, uh, a conversation that was not uh, uh, viewed through the prism that the powers that be have set up that allow us or that force us to or motivate us to dislike each other, you know, to fight, they might still walk away from that meeting and go, well, I don't agree with any of his decisions, but it's clear that he has his son's best interest at heart and maybe the person that I'm sitting with wouldn't have made those decisions and that's fine. But, you know, they wouldn't walk away going, I'm the cartoon that the powers that be are making money off painting me as and vice versa. You know, look, a lot of these people show, you know, I can't stand Donald Trump at all. I think he's dangerous. He's a fucking moron. But I understand why, at least in the first time around people voted for him because a lot of people felt that the people who were there to represent him were not representing them and they're not um you know so but i also get the fact that when you watch youtube and you send it to your liberal friends and i'm very progressive it's like oh look at these idiots they can't even answer this question about you know what they don't like about this or that or the other and it's like okay yes it's funny and yes it's it's preaching to the choir and at the same time you know that's edited right it's like there are probably 90% of the people they approached were normal people who were just like That's giving answers that you may not agree with. And they went in and they cherry picked the 5% or the 10% or whatever it was. And they said, let us help shape this narrative. So you think these people are cartoon character buffoons. And some of them are, but I mean, even then it's like, well, you're going to, you know, maybe they're too busy working to really be self-reflective or to read a book or to read the paper. Maybe they don't have those advantages that, 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 that I have. So I just, I just think most people are good. And, um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, I don't mind debating Xbox, PlayStation, you know, whatever it's fun and it's stupid, but you know, I know it's fun and it's stupid. And there's a point where I think a lot of people just allow it to become more than that. And sometimes I get caught yeah. up in it and I get annoyed with those people and sometimes I just step back and go, what the f are you doing? It's like, you're a grown man. You're a grown man. And you are literally letting this matter to you. Uh, it's crazy to me. No, I, I hear you. I, console wars is kind of an interesting thing that it's still, it's still going strong all these years. It's just kind of mutated a little. Uh, my buddy, Tony, who uh, covers this topic a lot. Tommy Tallarico, he says that his problem with David is that you defend Tommy Tallarico as being, I, I forget how he phrased it, a good guy or a good yeah. developer. Well, he's not really a developer. I mean, that's, you know, he's, he, a, yeah, he's a musician, but he's a musician. He's an entrepreneur. He he's on development teams as a musician, as a sound guy, but, and he's contributed to design ideas and stuff, but I don't think Tommy would, you know, so I don't, I don't think that is an accurate description, but I do, I, I, I've never had a reason to think Tommy's a bad guy. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, I, a lot of people will, uh, you know, like to, you know, watch this five hour fucking video. No, I'm not going to watch a fucking five hour video. If you've got a smoking gun that makes Tommy Tallarico 
uh, literally the shyster that you claim he is that was out to steal your money from the very beginning and all this, allow me to see it. I'm, my mind is open. I mean, I don't think that's Tommy. I've never gotten a sense that's Tommy. But sure, let me see that. But don't f***ing send me, oh, you gotta watch these six videos and go to this, right? F*** you, motherfucker. If you're gonna ass assassinate someone's character, then you better f***ing show up with more than, you know, reams of paper where I have to do the work. You know, do the work yourself, and then we'll talk. But as for Tommy, I'm assuming what he's talking about, which has gotten people upset with Tommy, is the Amico, correct? I'm assuming that's mm -hmm. his... Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the, the biggest one. Yeah, so, I mean, I... I was Tommy Tallarico sitting there from the very beginning or at any time throughout the process going, we're going to f*** these motherfuckers out of their money. I am the biggest f***ing con man there is. Uh, yeah, sure, maybe. I have no evidence of that. What I know uh, is I went down to Intellivision in Orange County. They actually wanted to work with me, and it just wasn't really what I wanted to do and didn't make any sense to work together. But I saw their offices. I met their people. I saw their hardware. I played on their hardware. Um, you know, um, and I heard Tommy on that day and that was probably a year before it was supposed to launch or give or take 12 to 18 months before it was supposed to launch before they moved it and moved it and moved it. Um, you know, he was pie in the sky and the fuck out of it. He's like, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do that. You know, he clearly was, uh, you know, there, that kind of person is important for being, uh, and I, I, you know, in, in, in a, in a position of influence in a company, I love people like that. I am people like that, but it was clear he wasn't, he was in over his head from a CEO standpoint. Like, you know, when you're 12 months from launching new hardware, you probably want to kind of go, okay, we're feature locked, you know, we're done. Let's, let's get all, you know, but you know, Tommy's a dreamer. Tommy's a, a, a guy who, uh, you know, sometimes the dreams pan out like video games live and like, uh, you know, the games he worked on in the 90s and early 2000s. And sometimes they don't. Um, but I, I've not seen any evidence to suggest he was out to f people over. Um, and even like when he would he called me, you know, about six months ago, we talked for a little bit and, and I was like, oh, yeah, people are saying that, you know, you guys aren't even answering the phones and all this stuff because customer service and you're f people. And he says, you know, it's so weird uh, he says the CEO, the new CEO is literally packaging up people's refunds and answering phones because we don't, we had to fire our customer service people. He, the CEO is literally answering phones, at least he was six months ago, according to Tommy, and sending this stuff, uh, sending receipts back or PayPal back or whatever, whatever it was. So again, I get that if you think Tallarico is some kind of con man, you would say, Jesus, Jaffe, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're. Uh, in bad company and thus we're going to judge you as such and i would say show me show me something but so far what i see is a guy who got in over his head had a really good vision i still believe in his vision um and he just wasn't the guy uh he was the guy to launch the company and maybe design for the company he was not the guy to run the company when it was trying to launch hardware um, and even Sony had that. Sony brought in a guy named Steve Race at the beginning to launch the PlayStation. The minute it was launched, he was gone. They brought in other people because they were like, look, it's launching hardware is different than running a company that makes hardware and sells hardware that's already been launched. And you need different skills depending on where you're at in the race. And so, again, your friend, uh, maybe he's right, but every, you know, make a, if you can't prove to me that this guy is a bad guy in a minute, of 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 evidence you know i don't i don't need to you know decipher the fucking hieroglyphics in, in in a pyramid with before the rosetta stone shows up in order to go you know and, and that's what they're asking me to do give me a minute video show me what he did i love it when people approach you on social media and they want your opinion on something and they're like oh okay so i'll respond they're like no you have to educate yourself you have to go you have to go take this uh louis like feels like taking a six month response course yeah give me you know i mean again I, I where's your friend put him on the phone let's call him right now um if he's got evidence let's hear it and let's hear it succinctly do you think he has evidence to suggest that tommy was trying to f people out of their money i i do not know necessarily this is not my specialty project um and but i mean he's your friend do you think he has the evidence would he be someone that would go off half cocked and assassinate someone's character no, I don't think he would. I, I think the point you're making here, though, is that people are mistaking 
purposeful corruption, like like sure. malintent with getting over your skis, which yeah. to be to be honest, it sounds and, like from your own experience. That. Tommy totally got over his skis. He got not only did he get over his skis, he realized it, but he realized it too late. He should have brought the guy in or some guy in or woman in to do the job that he was doing, or at least part of it, a long time before. But when you're running the company and everybody, you know, I'm sure there are people who weren't yes men there, but maybe it took the level of failure for him to go, oh shit, I can't do this, right? I mean, I don't know, but yeah, I, I've never known Tommy to be, uh, I think you're exactly right when you say over his skis versus an intentional, yeah, that, there's no evidence of that, or if there is, I'd love to see it because I haven't seen it ever. Okay. Last question, and you're probably, you're probably sick of hearing this one or, or not a huge fan of it because you already kind of said that you're uninterested in going back into gaming, but if someone approached you and they're like, we have the stupid, the studio is ready. We have the game. It's basically green lit. We have mm-hmm. a spot ready for you, David Jaffe. Would you? Would you jump in? No, I mean, um, I mean, I'm consulting right now. I'm doing consulting work at the moment uh, with a couple of video game companies, and you know, it's nice to kind of puddle around in those waters again from time to time. But no, no, I, 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 I am. Look, I'm not, it's not like I'm making any real money doing what I'm doing right now, but I am having the same level of engagement and fun and um, joy that I got when I was making video games on PS1 and PS2, right? I, I don't, I, I don't need, um, I don't, there's no need there. Like what would it, you know, if somebody said, Hey, you can work and it won't feel like work, and you'll be a multi-multi-millionaire, okay, sure, I'll do it for six months. But it would only be about, I needed the money. It would never, I mean, you never know, you never never say never, but I have said what I needed to say in that medium, and this current medium allows me to express what I want to express quicker, with almost zero interference, um, and with a lot more time to sort of just, uh, you know, uh, focus almost 100% on what is interesting me. So I know I have no no interest in that at all. Okay. What I would like to see is that wonderful Twisted Metal remake that you worked on. We could just give um, that to current platforms. That would I make would me that. very happy. I would love that. I mean, I do think there is a new Twisted Metal coming is my understanding. I don't know when we'll see it. Uh, I don't even know what it is. I'm not involved with it at all. Um, there, It's really interesting though. So uh, my biggest concern about a new twisted metal has always been that there's not a lot of i'm sure a great designer could figure it out and maybe someone with the new twisted has but for me i've never been able to really figure out what to do to keep it interesting for modern gamers because modern shooters where you're not trapped in a car offer so much more uh fidelity of play and motion and whatnot, right? And so the other day there was uh, there's a alpha right now for a game called Speed Freaks, which is in the Warhammer universe that you can play on Steam, and it's it's really good. It looks nice, it plays nice. Um, you know, I don't like the way they do the aiming, but whatever. But yeah, I I get in there, and after all the bells and whistles of modern graphics wear off, I'm back to just like the same gameplay I've been doing since you know a long long time. And in terms of vehicle combat, and yeah, you can kind of sweeten the pot with your modes. So it's kind of like, okay, my character can't do as much as in a normal shooter, but maybe if we really plus up the mode design and make that relatable to people who are driving cars or whatever, but even, and they do a little bit of that, but it's still like, okay, I'm done. I'm going back to Call of Duty because I can duck and I can jump and I can sprint and I can sprint jump and I can climb and i can you know lay flat or i can go on my knee and change the reticle it's like once you've had that degree of agency when it comes to sort of projectile attacking for the most part all you're going back to with vehicle combat is a a wonderful fantasy like a conceptual fantasy but that doesn't sustain a video game that lasts for a little bit 10 20 minutes two or three hours and then you're like, okay, but mechanically at an abstract level, this is too simple for modern gamers. So I think it may be solvable, but I wouldn't f- know how to do it. I don't know. I had not thought about it that way. Uh, but that's why you worked at game design and I haven't. Uh, 
Okay. And by the way, have you ever, like, I, there are always rumblings that there's like a Twisted Metal TV show. And I think there's even rumblings about a God of War TV show. Do you know if any of that is true? Do you have an insight? You do, I'm not saying that. this, I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. And I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. Okay. I'm saying this, and I'm not even saying this to be condescending, like, let me help you. But I do want to let you know, because you're like a pro journalist, right? I mean, you write. Yes. Right. I mean, you know, the, the, the Twisted Metal TV show comes on in June, right? It's already, there's a trailer, there's a teaser. It's already been, in, we know who's starring in it. It's almost like, did you not do any research at all? I, uh, I did lots of research. It's just that's, I have it, I'll throw it in my notes to, to I, check again, on I that. I don't buy, I'm not like, oh, fuck you. I'm, I'm more like, interesting. Because as a guy who interviews other people with my channel, I'm just like, I'm, I'm fascinated and again, this is not. A, I know you're probably going to take this like, "What a dick." I'm not. I'm. I'm just saying. It's, it's like, it's fine. Because I, I, you know, when you reached out to me and said, "Hey, come do the show," I was like, "Who is this guy?" And I looked, and it's like, "Oh, he's published in all these places, and he's a real fucking journalist." And I'm just amazed. It's like, wow, he's asking me that question. But yeah, and then in in God of War is an Amazon show. Uh, that all they've done with that is they've announced it. Um, I think they may have announced who the showrunners are and whatnot. But that is still very much kind of in the ether. No one really, it, people know, but I don't, it's not public. Um, but Twisted Metal though, yeah, Twisted Metal is probably going to be, uh, from what I gather, you'll see another trailer on Keeley's Summer Game Fest next week. Uh, and then the show premieres on Peacock with Anthony Mackie, who plays the Falcon. Uh, and Samoa Joe and Will Arnett are doing double duty on the Sweet Tooth character. Um, in terms of Samoa Joe is from at WWE is the body and then Will Arnett does the voice. Uh, I think Nev Campbell from Scream and, and uh, Lincoln Lawyer or whatever the f*** that's called is in it. And there's one other uh, actress, I think, from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. The woman in that is in it. So, yeah, that's that's been loaded. They finished season one. Who knows if they'll get a season two. The trailer looks like a lot of fun and the people who are making it are the guys and girls who wrote Zombieland Cobra Kai, uh, and uh, I think some of them worked on Deadpool. So it's a really good group of people uh, who I think get the brand. But again, you never know till you see the episodes. But I'm 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 optimistic. But we'll see. Okay. Well, that that raised my expectations. Yeah. yeah. Like like how Kratos's name uh, got away from me. You know, sometimes you can research a lot, and sometimes things fall through. They do. They do. But you know what? I'm going to call you on it because it's fun. That's fine. I I I I made a mistake. It was more than fair to point it out. God damn right. And I make mistakes all the time. I'm not being a dick. I'm just. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was an interesting mistake. I wonder why I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. This is important to me, not to you or your audience, but I'm going to figure this out. Why is it important to me? Um. I think because as a guy who doesn't. You know, I don't consider myself a journalist. I don't have a journalist degree. I took one journalism class in school. Uh, I love journalism. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it professionally, uh, but I, I I love what it. I, I love the importance of it. And I know this is entertainment journalism, but you know, journalism in general, though, I love. I think it's just delightfully, tragically important, uh, certainly in, in a democracy. And so I think as I'm trying to learn how to be an interviewer, because I'm doing interviews on my show. I think it's more that I'm coming at it from more of like a newbie learning. And I'm like, how, how do you ask that, but not know that? And, you know, and I'm not saying that as an insult, it's, that's why I'm interested in it because I'm trying to learn the craft that you've probably what spent 10 years, 15 years doing. That's it. That's all I got. Could be. Could be. Could be. I, I also think it's because it's a topic that, you know, very well and are very close to that. You're, you're very aware of. That's like, true you know, too. That's why, true. Why too. aren't you aware of this basic thing? Yeah. And well, to would... be fair, you probably retain a lot more information about the people you interview. I'll interview somebody and I'll cram like a motherfucker. And when I talk to them, I, I, I'm pretty fucking well prepared. And the second the camera goes off, I don't remember any of it. Not a goddamn, I don't remember who they are. So, you know, maybe that's my weakness. It's just like, yeah, but you don't remember these people. I'm like, I know. Because my brain just works that way. Then I move on to something else. I feel I've hurt your feelings. Here's a hug for the bison in the background. If you want, he'll give it to you later tonight. I don't want to be so presumptuous that you would take it from me. So your bison, who's an animate object that doesn't think, probably, maybe, uh, gets the hug. And then you can do with that hug what you want. Thank you. The bison and uh, the bison, I, uh, therefore, from that 
I appreciate the hug. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, bud. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you to everyone again for turning in, for tuning into Culturescape. Thank you to Bain Books and Young Voices for help publishing this program. Until next time, my friends, keep geeking out. Bye.